Good morning and welcome. Thanks for joining us today. We're so glad that you've tuned in. Let me invite you to turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 9. The book of Hebrews, chapter 9. That's where we're going to find our text this morning in Hebrews, chapter 9. We're in the section of the book of Hebrews that compares the old sacrificial system and the temple with a new covenant that was brought in by Jesus Christ. The idea of a blood sacrifice fills the pages of the Bible. The word blood is found over 400 times. Someone has said that no matter where you cut the Bible, it bleeds. And the New Testament book that mentions the word blood more than any other book is the book of Hebrews. It appears 21 times in just 13 chapters. It appears four times in the five verses that we're going to be reading today. Now you probably recognize the source of the title of my message. It comes from one of my favorite hymns. So let me just tell you the story behind uh, uh, the, the music. In the decades following the Civil War, America was experiencing a spiritual awakening born after the turmoil of a nation divided. Elisha Hoffman was an evangelical Presbyterian pastor in Ohio who had served as a private in the Union Army. And one of his chief gifts was hymn writing. And he wrote over 2,000 hymns, including Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. But his favorite subject was the cross. In 1878, he wrote the hymn that asked these questions. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you fully trusting in this grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So I borrowed a phrase from the chorus for my message title. Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? So let's dig into Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15 this morning to read about the soul-cleansing power of the blood of Jesus. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But Christ came as high priest of the good things to come, with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this reason he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Now the discussion of the blood of Jesus continues throughout the rest of Hebrews chapter 9. Now next week, I'm going to preach a special message entitled, The Scarlet Thread in the Bible. And I'll be tracing the story of blood atonement all the way from Genesis to Revelation. God has always blessed the preaching of the blood of the cross. The year was 1949. A fresh young evangelist named Billy Graham broke onto the scene because of a successful crusade that had been held in Los Angeles. It was scheduled for three weeks, and it lasted eight weeks. Thousands of folks were saved, and Billy Graham gained national attention. 
Not long after that crusade, a professor from Cornell University wrote a letter to Billy Graham. He said, you are gifted and you have a great power of persuasion, but I have some advice. If you expect to be used worldwide, you're going to have to stop talking about the blood. It's out of date, and no enlightened man of the 20th century is going to swallow it. Billy Graham said, I determined at that moment to preach more on the blood of Jesus Christ than ever before. This morning, I want to share with you four aspects of the soul-cleansing power of the blood. Here's the first aspect. The blood of Jesus removes the stain of our sin. In our passage that we read, uh, we saw that the old covenant sacrifices only cleanse the priest outwardly. And the Jews have become more concerned with outward cleanliness than inward purity. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus said to the hyper-clean freaks, he said, You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and (coughs) self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Now you probably have heard about the sacrifices of bulls and goats, but the idea of the ashes of a red heifer may be new to you. In Numbers chapter 19, God gave the Israelites instructions on how to purify themselves if they had touched a corpse. They were told to take the ashes from a red heifer, which would include the animal fat and the ashes from the wood. Then they were to add water to the fat and the ashes. You know, we read that today and we say, well, wow, God sure gave them some mysterious, weird instructions. But when you think about it, it makes perfect sense. It may sound strange to us today, but does anyone know enough about chemistry to tell me what you get when you mix animal fat, wood ashes, and water? You actually get soap. (laughs) God was simply saying, do yourself a favor. If you've touched a dead body, use soap and water and you'll be healthier. But even during Old Testament times, God warned them that there's a difference between outward ritualistic purity and inward spiritual purity. God spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, and he said in Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 22, he said, for though you wash yourself with lye and use much soap, yet your iniquity is marked before me says the Lord God. Now, outward cleanliness, it is important, but we all have a stain of sin that no soap can remove. Compared to the holiness of God, even our good deeds are described as filthy rags. So what must our lives and sinful deeds look like to God? But thankfully, he doesn't cast us aside because we have a dirty heart. Soap can cleanse the body, but the blood of Jesus is the only element in the universe that can cleanse our souls, and it works from the inside out. 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 tells us, But if we are living in the light as God is in the light, then we have fellowship with each other, and the blood of Jesus his Son cleanses us from all sin. A hillbilly woman with nine children had one of her boys fall into a tar barrel, and she was working hard to scrub him clean. She said, I declare... I think it would be easier to get rid of you and just have another one than to clean you up. You know, in our sinful, stained condition, God could have said, you know what, I'm just going to start over with a whole other planet. But instead, he sent his son to die for our sins so we can be clean. 
That's why he says to you and I, come on, let's reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, I can make them white as snow. That brings me to the second aspect about the blood that I want to talk about. The blood of Jesus restores our severed relationship with God. Our sin not only stains our soul, it separates us from a holy God. You know, the people couldn't approach God. Only one man, one time a year, could approach God. And he had to make sure that he was carrying the blood of the Lamb. A thick curtain in the temple separated the entire population from the world from the holiness of God. Let's go back to Adam and Eve again. They had a wonderful relationship with their Creator because there was no sin in their lives. There was no separation. I love that passage from the first chapters of the Bible that says God would come into the Garden of Eden in the cool of the evening and he would walk with Adam and Eve. I have a hard time imagining what that would look like because I can't conceive of what God actually looks like walking because the Bible says that God is not a man. But somehow, the presence and the glory of God was there walking right alongside Adam and Eve. Isn't that a beautiful picture of the relationship and fellowship that God had with Adam and Eve? I wonder what they talked about. Maybe God said, Adam, how are you doing? And Adam would say, I'm doing pretty good, Lord. How are you doing? And God says, well, I'm always doing okay. And then maybe God would ask Eve, how are you doing? And she would say, I'm fine, Lord. And Adam gives me a little trouble every now and then, but nothing that I can't deal with. They had a wonderful relationship, so intimate. But all that changed. When Adam and Eve sinned, that beautiful relationship was destroyed. And they suddenly found themselves separated from God. Well, the New Testament teaches that our sin has alienated us from a holy God. We read in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. When the high priest sprinkled that blood on the mercy seat, their sins were not really forgiven. They were only covered for another year. It would be as if you owed money to a loan shark and you went to him and said, I can't pay the whole amount, but I'll give you a dollar. That's all that I have. And so the loan shark says, well, instead of breaking both your legs, I've got you covered for another year. But the size of your debt just got larger and there's going to be a payday someday. When Jesus died on the cross, that curtain in the temple was torn in two. It was a powerful message from God that there was no longer a separation. We now have access to our Creator (coughs) through the blood of the cross. I once read a story that happened in the emergency room of a hospital years ago. One evening, they brought in a teenage boy who had been critically injured in an automobile accident, and they were doing everything that they could to save his life. His parents soon arrived at his side, and the boy's parents had been separated for two years, but they hadn't divorced. They hadn't spoke to each other in many months, and the tension in the room was as thick as a knife. But here they were, face to face, on each side of the body of their dying son. And the boy was barely conscious and had been incubated and couldn't talk. And before he lost consciousness, he reached up and he took the hand of his father and he placed it in the hands of his mother. And the boy didn't make it, but from that night onward, the parents were reconciled. 
But oh, what a high cost of that reconciliation. That's exactly what Jesus did for us. We were alienated from God, and just before he died, Jesus took the hand of his loving Father, and he reached down and he took the hand of sinful humanity, and he brought us back together, and then he died. When you truly understand the depth of the love of Jesus and the cost that he paid, it's impossible to walk away from that kind of love. That brings me to the third aspect of the blood I want to talk about today. That is, the blood of Jesus ransoms us from our broken past. You know, the last verse in our text says, And for this reason, he is the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant, that those who are called may receive the promise of the eternal inheritance. Perhaps the most famous kidnapping for ransom case in American history happened in 1932. The 20-month-old son of Charles Lindbergh was kidnapped, and the kidnappers demanded a ransom of $250,000. Well, $50,000 was delivered, but the child was found dead. Four years later, Richard Hoffman was electrocuted for the crime, but he denied his guilt up until his execution. The Bible teaches that the blood of Jesus was a ransom payment for our sins. We read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, For you know that God paid a ransom to save you from the empty life you inherited from your ancestors, and it was not paid with mere gold or silver which lose their value. It was the precious blood of Christ, the sinless, spotless Lamb of God. Jesus paid a ransom. But to whom did he pay it? You know, some folks suggest the devil was paid off at the cross, but nothing could be farther from the truth. Jesus didn't owe the devil a dime. All the sacrifices were made to God alone. Remember when I said that the sin of the Israelites kept piling up, just collecting interest? There had to be a payday someday, and that happened on the cross. God demands a perfect sacrifice, a lamb without spot or blemish, and none of us qualify, but Jesus became sin for us. Gordon MacDonald is a former pastor and chancellor of Denver Seminary. He relates an interesting dream that he once had. In the dream, he was at a party with a bunch of strangers, but everyone had a name tag. And he looked in the mirror, and his says, Hello, my name is Gordon. And underneath it, his name, it said, Adulterer. Another man had a name tag that said, Hello, my name is John. Liar. Another said, Hello, my name is Jane. Gossip. Another one said, Hello, my name is Mary alcoholic. The room was packed with people all wearing name tags, naming one of their sins. Then in his dream, Jesus walked into the room, and without saying a word, he walked around and he started pulling off the name tags of people and putting them on his own robe. He did this until he was covered in name tags. And that's what Jesus did on the cross. He became sin for us. So we don't have to live according to our broken, sinful past. But one of the tools the devil uses is that he wants to make you feel guilty about the sins of your past that have been forgiven. Some of you are on a lifelong guilt trip, and that's one trip that you ought to cancel. Too many Christians lose their joy and effectiveness because they spend all their time looking in the rearview mirror, regretting all their past mistakes. 
The reason that the rear view mirror is so small and the windshield in front is so large is because where you've been isn't nearly as important as where you're going. That brings me to aspect number four of the blood. The blood of Jesus rescues us from a hopeless future. You know, the blood of Jesus has the power to cleanse us from sin. It restores our severed relationship with God. It ransoms us from our broken past. Those are all things that are present blessings. They're true today. But there is a future aspect of the power of the blood. Every person without Christ faces a hopeless future. But for those of us who have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, our future is filled with hope. We read in Romans chapter 5, verse 9, And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, He will certainly save us from God's condemnation. There was a terrible night in Egypt many centuries ago. God had told the people to kill a lamb and to roast it. Then they were to take the blood of that lamb and to rub it on the sides and the top of the doors of their homes. And then the family was supposed to go inside under the blood and eat the lamb. It was an act of faith and obedience. That evening, a terrible judgment passed over the entire land. But whenever the death angel saw the blood applied to the doorway, he passed over those homes. For those families who obeyed and trusted God, they were safe under the blood of the Lamb. But for those families who didn't follow God's simple instruction, there was death in that home. That was God's way of teaching us that one day every one of us will face his judgment. When God sees the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ applied to your heart, judgment will pass over you. So what are some of the personal applications that we can take from these four truths today? Here's the first application. The blood of Jesus is a powerful weapon against the enemy. You know, Satan hates the blood of Jesus. And as the song says, there is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. One of the greatest scenes in the entire book of Revelation comes in chapter 12, where we see the saints of God, the church of God, in battle against the false man-made religion of paganism. We read in Revelation chapter 12, verse 11, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. See, that's the way we overcome the enemy as well. When he comes tempting and attacking. Remind him that you have been made clean by the blood of the Lamb. The second application I want to share with us is, because God has covered your sins with his blood, then you should forgive yourself. When you place your faith and your trust in Jesus, you are set free from the guilt of the past and the judgment of the future. Your sins are gone. Do you know where the deepest spot under the ocean is? It's in the Mariana Trench, northeast of the Philippine Islands. It's over uh, 36,000 feet deep. Now, to give you an idea of the depth of that trench, if Mount Everest could be placed into the Mariana Trench, there would still be a mile of water covering the tip. It is so deep that if you dropped a 10-pound dumbbell from a ship on the surface, it would take over an hour to sink to the bottom. We know more about the surface of Mars than we do the floor of the Mariana Trench. 
The water pressure at the deepest spot is over 15,000 pounds per square inch. That's the same pressure created in the barrel of a 12-gauge shotgun when it is fired. And it's totally dark down at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. Only a few small shellfish live there in the thick darkness and that excruciating pressure. You may be thinking, well, Pastor, you're getting pretty deep here. No pun intended. Well, I want you to go deep in your mind, because according to the Bible, there's something else at the bottom of the Mariana Trench. It's my sin and your sin if you come to Jesus for forgiveness. The prophet Micah tells us in Micah chapter 7, verse 18, Who is a God like you? You do not stay angry forever, but delight to show mercy. You will again have compassion on us. You will tread our sins underfoot and hurl all our iniquities into the depth of the sea. God cast your sins in the depths of the sea, and he placed a no fishing sign there for the devil. One of the first hymns I remember hearing as a child growing up has stuck with me all these years. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. So are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? If you are, then your soul is clean before the Lord, and your sins are buried in the deep, dark depths of his loving forgiveness. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood, Hallelujah, what a Savior. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today. Lord, we're thanking you for the blood of Jesus. We're thanking you for the forgiveness of sin. Lord, we thank you for Jesus, who willingly died for us on Calvary. Father, I pray today that if there's someone tuned in who has not accepted your gift of salvation, Lord, today they would make that decision. Father, we pray today for your help. We pray that you would speak to our hearts, and we ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thanks for joining us today. Next Sunday, we're going to be continuing our sermon series out of the book of Hebrews. We hope that you join us. This coming Wednesday, we continue our live online Bible study out of the book of 1 Corinthians. That's Wednesday mornings at 10.30 a.m. Eastern Time. Thanks again for joining us today. May God bless you as you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You are loved. We'll see you next time.